Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this short game to video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to start things out with a couple of Intel pieces of news. The first one being that TSMC will be helping Intel produce chips, at least in the short term. Tales of uh, Intel's 14nm manufacturing capability being stretched beyond its limits are not new. We know that their company are struggling to keep up with demands. If you were to look at, let's say, the new Coffee Lake refresh, that's a pretty good indicator that Intel are already struggling. There's a reason, after all, that those chips right now are just difficult to procure because, well, they're not able to make enough of them. So what are Intel to do? Sources speaking to Digi Times have told us what Intel are doing. They are asking TSMC to produce some chips. Although the sources didn't specifically state TSMC, it's the only company that would actually have the manufacturing capabilities to produce the chips within Intel specifications. So unless something else is going on in the industry we don't know about, TSMC make the most logical sense. So does that mean we're going to see Xeon chips from TSMC? No. They're not going to do that. Instead, at least in the short term, we will see chips from the Atom lineup as well as the Celeron lineup being made at TSMC's manufacturing facilities. But as we learned earlier this month, Intel are investing around a billion US dollars and bringing up the manufacturing capabilities of its 14 NM fabs. So at least in the long term, it probably won't be too much of an issue. But in the short term, this is the most logical thing that Intel can do. In the long term, of course, we also see Intel switching to the 10NM process. And a small update to the whole 10NM thing, by the way, is a bit of bonus for you. You might remember that uh, I did cover the fact that uh, Intel had uh, refuted the claims by semi-accurate that uh, they were going to be essentially scrapping 10NM. Well, semi-accurate, excuse me, have then uh, said, well, no, we stand by our claims, so we can only wait and see. Either way, the fact that 10NM has been delayed is not a particularly good look for Intel, but in the short term, perhaps the next several months, perhaps a year or two years or what have it, until uh, 10NM is a viable option, the best strategy is, of course, 14NM and to increase the manufacturing capability of that. So we can only wait and see how all of this unfolds. So in a continuation of Intel news, we have yet another departure from AMD to Intel. Over the past year or so, Intel have certainly procured a lot of talent from AMD. We've of course seen Chris Hook, Jim Keller, along with Radha Kodori. Although to be fair, uh, Jim Keller was not exactly directly from AMD. He did do, of course, a stint over at Tesla. So it went from AMD to Tesla to then Intel. But Raja Kodori is now working over at the discrete graphics division of Intel. Uh, Chris Hook is going to be one of the marketing guys at, at uh, Intel for the graphics division. And now they have yet another acquisition. And his name is Darren McPhee. Now he's actually been with ATI slash AMD for around 12 years. And he has confirmed that he is now going to be starting his job at Intel. Where he will be the marketing manager of the discrete graphics division. Now, just in case you missed it, at SIGGRAPH 2018, Intel did confirm that their first discrete GPUs will be ready for the market in 2020. There is some ambiguity exactly what we're going to be seeing out of these discrete GPUs, which is probably a subject for another video. But the likelihood is we're going to see, of course, multiple different SKUs, and almost certainly some of those are going to target gamers. Just, we could base that upon uh, Intel's recent moves with the gaming side of things. Uh, what they've been doing with the graphics drivers for their iGPUs, uh, some of the verbiage that uh, some of their marketing, as well as their heads over at the gaming divisions as well as the graphics divisions. So it just kind of makes sense that uh, we will see a multiple uh, avenues of attack from Intel when it comes to their GPUs, which is definitely going to be interesting. On the subject of GPU news, let's discuss a piece of AMD news on the very same subject. So currently, AMD have a couple of options. They've got the RX 570, the 580, and if rumors are to be believed, and it looks almost certain at this point, we're also going to see the 590, which is essentially a die shrunk version of Polaris. And it's gonna pretty much just be higher clock speeds from what we gather anyway, of the current 580. And that's gonna be in the mid range. And then of course, they've got Vega 56 as well as 64. But 
However you want to argue the 1080 and 1080 Ti's versus Vega 56 and uh, of course 64 as well as of course the GTX 1070 in terms of pricing, there is one thing that is abundantly clear. Nvidia are hitting back hard with the RTX lineup of cards. Yes, it's arguable that the 2080 Ti isn't a massive performance leap over let's say the 1080 Ti, but that doesn't particularly matter. What does matter is that even if you were to say the 30 or 40% leap from one generation to the other, not only do Nvidia have ray tracing, but they already had the, the lead with the 1080 Ti. So Vega 64 is just unable to compete with the high-end Pascal cards and certainly cannot compete with the high-end Turing cards. So there's a question then, what are AMD to do? There have been an awful lot of questions regarding this and fortunately, Lisa Su from AMD has actually confirmed that yes, AMD will be getting back into the high-end GPU market. So this puts at least some fears to rest that AMD will just focus on the mid-range and we're never going to see high-end cards from the company again. Just a quick reminder then, next year Navi 10 is supposedly going to be mid-range only. So it's going to put out roughly the same performance as let's say a GTX 1080 Ti now, but of course that's going to be midpoint next year where presumably faster cards are going to be on the shelves. So let's say it puts out slightly slower or slightly faster performance than the 1080 Ti, but does so at around the 300 to 400 US dollar mark. No one is exactly going to complain, but almost certainly we're going to hear rumors of a 7nm Turing die shrink or something similar. In other words, uh, Nvidia will continue to push forward. And almost certainly the high end will continue to move forward. So will AMD just be doomed to languish in the mid-range cards, which isn't necessarily unprofitable for the company, but in terms of mindshare and in terms of boasting rights, certainly high-end cards go a long way. Well, in a telephone interview to Barron's, no, Lisa Sue has confirmed this is not the case. She didn't exactly specify what their roadmap was and their plans. She simply stated that they would be competitive in the high-end graphics space, which is super duper ambiguous and could also just mean that we see server-orientated GPUs. So for example, the Vega 7NM, which eventually will of course be replaced with whatever else, and therefore the gamers will not uh, get to reap the benefits of this. But this is almost certainly not the case. Almost 100% to me, AMD will focus on getting the mid-range first, which is going to be, of course, Navi 10, and then presumably several months later, they will start getting the high-end SKUs in as well. It makes sense because by the time Navi comes to the shelves, we can presume that the 2060s and other cards will almost certainly be readily available from NVIDIA. So it makes a great deal of sense when you look at the most popular GPUs, which would be like, let's say the 1060 right now, for AMD to quickly grab into that market get as much money as possible while they're raking in cash from the Vega 7 NMs that they're selling to uh, HPC providers, high performance computer, uh, high performance computing, excuse me, and then start targeting the higher end uh, gamers later. But exactly how all of this works is very ambiguous. And finally, there are a slew of rumors concerning Zen 2 along with Rome. Now these rumors do originate on the website Semi-Accurate, and they cite that they have various sources within AMD that have confirmed certain aspects of these chips. Now I will warn you, the full article is locked under a subscription level, and to purchase that, you either have to be a student, which is 100 US dollars for the year, or you could be an industry professional, and that's gonna cost you 1,000 US dollars for the year. Now, just out of respect to them, I don't wanna give away all of the details here, uh, and frankly, some of it is still a bit ambiguous, but I will go through the important points. So, a quick refresher then. Right now, we have Zen Plus, which of course is built on the 12NM process, which was obviously a slight refresh of the original Zen architecture. Lisa Su has said many times that, in fact, even in the Baron's call that I mentioned just a few moments ago uh, regarding the GPU side of things, that Zen is their long-term strategy, and they have multiple different generations of Zen. Zen 2 is going to launch next year, and it's going to be a 7NM chip. From the rumors, it's going to feature around a 12, 13, 14, possibly 15% at the very outside uh, percent IPC gain over its previous generation, which is not shabby. 
Now that to me is a very nice jump indeed, especially when Intel has not been anywhere near as aggressive. But there are a lot of conflicting reports of what we're going to see from both the desktop variants, such as the Ryzen CPUs, which we can presume to be like the 3700 and the 3600 series, along with Threadripper, and of course Epic. Lisa Su in uh, several statements, including at Computex, did state that if you were to have purchased the original generation of Epic, which, by the way, remember uses the original Zen architecture, Zen 2 is going to be debuting with Epic. Uh, if you do own the original uh, Zen, uh, sorry, the original uh, Epic uh, platform, you will be able to plonk in the next generation of Epic processors. But these rumors do say that it could possibly be an entirely new socket. Now, an entirely new socket doesn't necessarily mean that we will not see backwards compatibility. It could mean that, yes, we do uh, see the ability for the, let's call them Epic 2s, to run in the uh, older motherboards, but perhaps you will see limited functionality. One of the rumors is that we will actually see PCIe 4.0 supported here, although that has not been 100% confirmed, at least according to these rumors. But if we were to see that, obviously, if you were to plug it into an older motherboard, then no, that would no longer be a thing. Rome is said to have eight cores per die, and this will be an 8x8 configuration. So once again, we see eight cores times eight is 64 cores total with 128 threads if you include SMT. Moving away from the server side of things, there are so many different rumors about the configuration that we're going to be seeing for Zen 2 for desktops. We could either see um, eight uh, core configurations, such as the 1700 or the 2700 CPUs, or it's possible that AMD could just feel that 7NM allows them to be more uh, confident. Inevitably, I'm going to get the questions of what does that mean for desktops? What does that mean for the 3700? Are we going to see a 12 core configuration, a 16 core configuration? I don't think we're going to see 16 cores for uh, AM4. One thing is certain, 7NM affords AMD a lot of flexibility when it comes to both servers and regular desktop processors. It's possible that AMD could continue to play the core count game with Intel, and I feel that that's a very likely scenario. I don't think we're going to jump to 32 cores or, you know, possibly even 16 cores. I feel that 12 processor cores is probably about the maximum they're going to push for the equivalent of the 37 or 3800 or whatever they're going to call it. But either way, it's going to be fascinating to see exactly how much market share AMD can take from Intel. This is assuming, of course, that Intel can't counter. I mean, it is technically possible that Intel could release a different processor skew or maybe cut the price down for a specific HEDT lineup. We just don't really know what Intel are going to do in the long term. But it's going to be really cool to find out. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Normal stuff if you have, like, share, comment and subscribe. You can find us linked on Patreon down below. And you can also find an Amazon affiliate link should you so desire. With all of that said, take care of yourselves. Bye for now.